Thank you. I hope I'm, it doesn't sound like I'm monologuing, but uh, it's a really different topic. I was the, my first talk was more like philosophy and where I come from, and uh, this talk is more about the Open Earth Monitor uh, project. Um, and as I said, there was this uh, surf meeting in uh, in Utrecht, and the uh, topic was the this digital Earth twin. And this term, you know, it's not a it's not a new term. I think Al Gore first called it a, uh, like a digital earth, so the replica of the planet. Um, and uh, let's say, um, I, I came with this slide in, in, in Utrecht and I said, well, you know, you could do replica two ways. Uh, one is the morphological replica, you know, so it's just like a perfect uh, a photograph. And the other is like uh, the behavioral replica. And actually I said, you could have a behavioral replica, which is actually poor quality photographically. Uh, so that's this Earth System uh, Data Lab. It's 20 kilometers. It's very poor quality, but it is uh, it uh, can simulate the behavior of the system. Um, and then you have like a perfect uh, replica, like a Google Maps. Uh, that's a perfect replica, which is uh, without any function. There's no behavior in the system. Uh, it's just purely like uh, geodata the most current geodata put in a system and you share it. Uh, so some systems, they, uh, they focus more on morphology, some on processes. And as you imagine, if you will go in the middle and if you get the perfect copy, so the copy that you cannot recognize that it's a copy, it's not a real world. And if, if the, you copy also the behavior, so you, you can play the system, and then you have this, uh, the matrix, right? So then you're in the matrix, basically. Um, so one-to-one -one digital earth twin. Uh, so what this talk about this open earth monitor, just introduction, um, you know, today you have this uh, 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 growing amount of EO data and luckily, uh, mainly thanks to Al Gore really, uh, they decided to release the satellite images in uh, open domain uh, as open data. And then European Space Agency uh, lagging behind, but uh, recognize that, and they also put the Copernicus basically all open, and you have these petabytes, petabytes, petabytes of data. Uh, and so what happened is, um, you know, it's inefficient to copy. You know, we used to have a copy of some satellite image. You could download the whole world satellite image on your desktop, right? But now the data, because of the resolution and also uh, spectral, uh, spectral diversity of the data, it's, the volumes are going exponentially. Um, and so it's not an option anymore that we will all download this data on our desktop. Um, and then somebody says, well, you know, you just bring the analysis to the data. And because the data is open, uh, if you think about this, you really need a one copy only. Copernicus, Landsat, all these projects. Because it's open data, you only need a one copy. And you need internet to <laughs> people to access it. Uh, so you don't need multiple copies of this data. And then a corporation like Google uh, went and made this, uh, got a couple of really talented people and uh, they bought this uh, uh, keyhole uh, a solution for digital earth, I don't know, and then they set up this group uh, and they set up this Google Earth engine. And uh, it's a, basically, uh, it's free, uh, you can access it, you just have to learn the code and you can access all these petabytes of data and you can compute. So you have a high performance computing, uh, whole world EO data, um, and you have this, all these APIs and everything. And so the, the question was like, uh, why don't we just all use Google Earth Engine? That's the key question. So why do you need all this uh, software and anything, you know? Because you can extend it, uh, it has all the functionality, you just connect with your laptop and you just go use Google Earth Engine, for all your projects, everything. Education, everything, right? Why not? Um, so that was something we discussed and um, and then there was a, a one person that had this talk uh, back in, uh, I don't know, a uh, couple of years ago, and uh, the slide goes, Google Earth Engine is evil. Um, and so there's this question, uh, is, it, uh, is these corporations, are they evil? And, um, you know, because uh, if I ask you, you know, if you look at on the table, you know, you need only one copy of your data. You, you want to have, if possible, free computing. Uh, and it's a, it's a major resource for computing. It's, I don't know, 100,000 servers. Uh, so, uh, so why don't we just all use Google Earth Engine, right? Uh, so then some people uh, try to explain it, why not? And, uh, and what happened in between? 
uh, Google Earth Engine used to be like a bit vague, you know, what you can do, but now it's clearly you can only use it for uh, research and education. So if you do a commercial project, you have to pay. So it's not a free anymore. Um, and um, so this thing also changed. And there is also somebody published a paper, uh, is Google evil? Have you, have you seen, like, read it please. It's very interesting. Uh, it's back in 2010, uh, but uh, yeah, somebody published a paper, is uh, Google evil? So uh, is it evil? I mean, personally, I think many of these corporations, they are a bit evil, you know, they do have hidden agendas and, and they trick you into things and they do want to maximize their profit and sometimes at any cost. Um, but you know, we are also not angels. We are also not, uh, you know, we mess up the climate and uh, we vote egocentrically. We love it that the voting is, uh, you know, anonymous. So we can vote whoever we like, right? And even the uh, groups that maybe, uh, maybe are not for the equal opportunities and I don't know, uh, um, anti-immigration, I don't know. So, uh, so we are also a bit evil. Uh, so we, found, we started with this idea, we wrote a proposal for the open earth monitor. And it's not that we want to be open Google Earth engine. So I have to say that because, you know, our budget is about 50 times less than what the Google Corporation has for this. So we cannot compete with that. So we're not going to be an open Google Earth engine and we don't have these resources to ask, to allow people to compute on our infrastructure. Open job, for sure, we wouldn't be able to afford it. Uh, I will have to sell my house just to uh, afford like a one week of computing on Google Earth Engine um, or, or one day. Uh, so, um, so, so we are not going to be an um, antipode of the Google Earth Engine, but we would like to try something else. And of course, I am also a big fan of Google. We do have Google accounts and I do really like a lot of things uh, what the Google Corporation, Alphabet uh, Corporation solved. So we are really actually, we are fans of Google. You could, you could officially say that, but we would like to try in this project uh, to promote a bit of different culture. Uh, and that's mainly culture which is uh, uh, decentralized, so federated, decentralized, uh, open source and unrestricted access. So these, these are a bit differences than what you have in Google Earth Engine. So we would like to uh, promote that. Of course, and we also, Non for profit, we're non for profit edition, so we, we, we don't want to uh, uh, simulate or um, uh, suggest that people, you know, should be making profit of environmental data, but we do support uh, uh, commercial, in the consortium we have commercial companies, and we do support business cases, and we think the business can be very healthy, you know, uh, as long as the business is not focused on monopolizing uh, blocking access uh, or exploiting, you know. Um, in that case, uh, we are, of course, we, we don't support it. But if the business is about increasing life quality, providing a better service, uh, making things more efficient, uh, helping uh, combat the climate change, um, uh, helping uh, uh, decrease the inequality in the world, then we support that business uh, full-heartedly. Uh, we had a launch in uh, uh, June uh, last year, we had a launch, and you can watch all the videos. Uh, everything OpenGeoHub does, by the way, when we teach, uh, when we uh, have workshops, we always video record. We have our own group that edits all the videos, and we don't publish them on YouTube or, you know, place to make more money for some guys in Silicon Valley, but we publish it in, in truly uh, academic uh, open uh, uh, platforms like the TIB, which is in Germany. So you can watch that. Um, and so uh, this open net monitor we are building also, we're not starting from scratch. I think the European funding where you say, oh, we start from scratch, it's a bit, <laughs> I think if somebody will pitch to me in, uh, uh, unless you really go out of box and you're developing something. But today if I was in Brussels and somebody says, we're starting from scratch, I would say, yeah, um, I, I don't know if you need to start from scratch because so many things are already there, right? It will be a waste. So we also, what we're doing, we're using existing infrastructures. So things that we've been developing, like the Echo Data Cube, OpenGeoHub uh, was developing, and there's the, um, the uh, OpenEO, uh, then there's the uh, COGS, you know, and the stack. There's this software that already exists. We don't start from scratch. There's a good system. So we just go and push them further, and we develop them further. So we build on these uh, existing infrastructures. Uh, what is ambition? This is GBIF. Um, uh, GBIF, uh, 
for those of you who don't know, Global Biodiversity Information Facility, they uh, did an enormous amount of work um, and they managed to uh, organize the infrastructure to get biological specimen data, uh, to harmonize it, clean it, and provide services to that data. And now I think it's almost one billion records or more. So there's a lot of data now, and it's really serious. And so it's a big data now. Uh, used to be like uh, 50 million, I don't know. Now it's like a billion of records. Uh, and you have all these species, and, and they solve the problem of taxonomy, for example. Taxonomy was like a war between biologists. And GBF went and just make you know one system that you can see the taxonomy relations, and then you can have a discussion, maybe flag it. But you know, there's an infrastructure to not to have a war, but to have a collaboration. Um, so, uh, so that's GBF. So now, ambitiously open it, monitor. We want to get this data. We want to make it as a cloud optimized and enable thousands of researchers, you know, to process the data and do spatial analysis uh, in a scalable way, so they can analyze only a chunk of data or they can analyze the whole thing. So that's our basically open at monitoring a nightshell. So how do you make this data more uh, easily accessible, more usable for spatial modeling, for you know, species distribution modeling and so on? And that's what we want to contribute. And so we have these five objectives. Um, and um, you can read about it. I mean, it's all, uh, I mentioned it actually in the previous talk, we are uh, primarily aiming at the uh, uh, European Green Deal. Uh, then also we work inside the Eurogeo, basically. Uh, we are closely connected with Eurogeo and we'll be developing these data portals and um, data sets and software. Uh, there's a one example of uh, usability. There's a data set Sentinel-1, global data sets. Uh, global data set published. There's a paper, a uh, nice group, uh, and they put the data. This is a Wageningen, so you can see that data. This is Sentinel-1 seasonal product. Uh, so something very different, a uh, new product that came out, and it is, they made it uh, open and it's available on Amazon, uh, and it's a hundred meter. But when you uh, combine the mosaic, uh, you can see that there's still some artifacts. There are artifacts and there are gaps. This is uh, Chicago, I think. So there's uh, huge gaps. And uh, so this data for us is not uh, analysis ready, basically, because it's incomplete. Uh, and there's artifacts. And so what we do, we then uh, take this data, we gap fill it, we try to remove the artifacts, and uh, we create what we call ARCO. Um, if you knew the word ARCO, analysis ready, cloud optimized, uh, and analysis ready for us is complete, consistent, current, um, and uh, complete, consistent, current, yes. So, so these are the data set that you don't have to spend as a data scientist a significant of time filling the gaps, uh, removing the problems, you know, uh, trying to understand it. So remember the word ARCO. And we would like to make this ARCO, we will do it for European uh, use cases and for the global use cases, we will make this ARCO data and we hope to then enable, we have about 30 use cases and some of these use cases you will see. And because the time is running out, I just want to say um, we are inspired by existing projects and one project that popped up, and these days everybody talks about it, is uh, Mastodon. It's created actually by one person. He uh, started the, uh, most of the development. Um, and then um, this, this is classical example where you have a federated system, and pe but federated, so you have multiple servers, they have their own installation, but it's all consistent, it's all seamless. It's consistent, you can follow the whole stream of Mastodon, but it's distributed, it's decentralized. So they have some little standards they follow, it's all open source, there's no hidden agenda, there's no selling, nobody selling your data to some corporation, right? And it works, and now I switched also, I basically as soon as this thing mess started happening, I kind of had a really bitter feeling about all this Facebook and stuff, but as soon as the Twitter, and I was a big fan of Twitter, by the way, it really hurt me to shut down my Twitter, right? But when I saw the Mastodon, it's actually better, you know? I immediately said, oh, no, this is over, game over. As soon as I see that they, somebody blocks me on Twitter, what I want to post, game over. Don't want to do, do there that anymore. So I switched to Mastodon, and I highly recommend you do also uh, switch to the non-commercial um, social uh, channels. Um, and so just to conclude, um, uh, the same thing as I spoke in the previous talk, uh, you know, you can do decentralized federated systems. Uh, computing is expensive, but if you do, if you separate the development from the production 
it's the best way to go. Do the testing on your laptop. Once you figure out the things, you don't need a supercomputing center. Then learn a bit computer science and learn how you can then deploy and do computing on, uh, um, on different uh, systems. Uh, document your code, that's really the key. That I will repeat that in my, my lectures always. Document your code, make computational notebooks, use uh, rbookdown, quarto, uh, snakemake, uh, Rian hub, Rihanna hub. Uh, so please use all these systems to document the code to do more professionally. Use the cog and stack uh, for uh, grid data, for vector data. We finish using GeoPark at MB tiles. It's amazing, it's magical. Uh, we just put, for example, uh, gigabytes of vector data. We put it and I can load it in my laptop. Uh, so it's really magical. It's a cloud solution for vector data. Uh, so please uh, uh, use the cloud optical geo solutions. Uh, and yeah, that's it. That's my uh, talk in summary about Open Net Monitor. Please come to our conference uh, in uh, Bolzano. It's going to be a big conference, so a few hundred people. Um, it's a great place to be and um, we are uh, co-organizing it, Open Geo Hub. So please come in Bolzano, uh, Global Workshop, Open Earth Monitor, uh, 4 to 8 uh, September 2023. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so uh, we, we have time for maybe one question from the audience. Any questions? Anybody Google Earth Engine uh, enthusiast? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. We use it also, don't worry. Yeah, it was interesting actually. In it, Rolf? Yeah. Yes, I can shout, so that's the, yeah, but the mic at the same time. Um, it, Tom, here at ITC, we often find ourselves working in environments where we collaborate with national governments that hold non-open data and should, not, and should have their data in non-open repositories. At the same time, some of the applications require access to open data. So that gives you a hybrid situation. That's a puzzle. There, there are solutions. There are solutions. That's uh, like, uh, for example, you control the encryption, access levels. You, uh, you can have people uh, having access to the outputs of the data mining, but not to the, uh, the, uh, the raw data. And now we work with this, we also work with highly confidential health data. You know, we sign NDAs. I sign now every week uh, some NDA. Data so so uh, the data sharing agreements um, or non-disclosure. Uh, so there are solutions, you know. But uh, you have to follow the law. That's absolutely, you cannot, uh, we cannot break the law. And, and absolutely private data should be protected, health data should be highly protected, and the best is the uh, proper encryption and uh, uh, access levels and uh, secure systems. Thank you. Yeah, uh, hybrid cloud systems also maybe uh, can be a solution. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tom, for your presentation.